Um, let us stand and sing hymn number 50. Praise the Lord, sing hallelujah.
wanted to uh, let you know a prayer request that came to me just before the service. Um, Zach Yoder, who we've been uh, praying for, Ella's grandson, uh, went into the hospital uh, with a heart issue, and he's uh, the gentleman that's waiting on a, a, a kidney transplant. Um, so we need to keep him, his family, Ella, in our prayers as well. Um, take a few minutes, center yourself on God this morning uh, before we uh, pray together as a community. Father, as we rest in these quiet moments, we can do nothing but express thanks to you for all that you've done, for all that you're doing, for all that you're going to do. We're thankful, God, for an opportunity this past week to be with family, to be with friends, giving thanks. And God, we want to take a moment to just express our thanks to you for life, for breath, for salvation, and for uh, the hope of eternity and the promise of eternity, God. We're so thankful. And God, we, we are thankful to be here this morning to freely worship you to be able to proclaim your goodness and your grace and your mercy to us, to accept the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, we're so thankful that you love us enough that you sent your Son, sent your Son to die for our sins so that we could live. And God, we when we think about that truth and that awesome gift, God, we want to pray for those that we're connected with, whether friendship-wise, whether family, that have yet to know you. God, we pray for an opportunity, whether that's through us, whether that's through another means to come to a loving and knowing relationship of, of you, to accept your son, to forgive, accept the forgiveness of sins, and to live in this new life that you offer. And God, as we talk about that, I know there's someone or possibly many people that come to our minds. We just want to whisper their names to you this morning. Pray, God, that you would intervene into their life some way, somehow. And God, as we think about the people that we're connected with here at Smithville, we know that there's needs, we know that there's hurt, we know that there's recovery. And God, we think about uh, Weston Mast and the amazing progress that he's making, but we do continue to pray for health and for strength for you to keep forming his little body. God, would you be with Joel and Holly? Would you give them rest? Would you give them energy? Would you be with Elisa too? Uh, being away from mom and dad is hard. Let me just pray for... Uh, for their situation, for a little Weston right now. God, we pray for Beulah. Pray that you continue to strengthen her. Pray for Malin as he's by her side. God, would you just uh, grant them grace and peace and healing. We can continue to pray for Al and Anna and Ross and Vesta. We're so thankful, God, that you're working in their life and that you're bringing healing and strength. God, we do pray that you would continue to strengthen their lives and show them your grace and your healing presence, God. And do, God, we do want to lift up Zach to you this morning. God, would you work a miracle in his life? 
Would you restore health, whether that's through um, a new kidney, whether that's through healing of the one that he has? God, would you, especially be with, be with him now in the hospital, God, would you just strengthen and bring healing, God, to his body? Would you be with family? Would you be with Ella, God? Would you give them the wisdom? Would you give them the reassurance and the peace that they need through this time? And God, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be able to learn, to grow in the knowledge of creation, the amazing account in Genesis where you created the world as we know it, even though there's sin, not your original plan. But God, we pray that that you would work, continue to work in and through Bob and Lois, through Answers in Genesis, through that ministry. Would you continue to allow truth to be proclaimed and for people to come to know you because of it? God, would you be with Bob this morning as he speaks to us? Would your words flow through him into our hearts and in our minds? And God, as we take a moment now to give back to you, all that you've given to us. May our tithes and our offerings be a blessing and be able to be furthering your kingdom. God, we're so thankful. We love you, praise you. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. I'd like to uh, introduce to you Bob Gillespie, um, speaker with Answers in Genesis, and he's going to share with us this morning. Bob. Thank you very much, Pastor. Greetings from Answers in Genesis and the Creation Museum. My wife and I travel all over the country representing Answers in Genesis and talking about the authority of Scripture. But, you know, we, uh, our home church is uh, uh, Pleasant Hill Baptist Church right here in Smithville, so... You know, we don't, but we, we don't get there very much anymore because we're always all over the place. Now, sometimes when we go back to our home church, we get a visitor's card. <laughs> I, you know, <clears throat> but as we travel around, uh, we get all kinds of questions, different people in different churches. And sometimes the question we get is something like this. Well, why is Genesis important? Why concentrate on that first book of the Bible? And we know it's not important how we got here. 
I mean, we know God did it, right? And the people are thinking, why would you build a, a creation museum? And why, why specialize on that with, you know, with a museum with, with dinosaurs and a planetarium? And, and especially people are thinking, why would you build a full-scale ark there in Kentucky? Yeah, we build a full-scale ark. They're coming by the thousands and the thousands, but people wonder why. You know, one lady said to me one time, what you're doing is nice. Hey, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, it's, not, it's a nice thing to do, but it's really not the most important thing. Right? You know what? I might be biased. All right, I am biased. I admit it. But I think that the message of answers in Genesis is the most important message for the Church of Jesus Christ today. That's a pretty bold statement. Right? But I want to explain to you what the message of answers in Genesis is and why it is so important for the church today. You see, most people think, well, we're all about creation, evolution, you know, that side issue. It's kind of controversial, too. I mean, you know, not everybody believes that about that first part of the book, you know. God could have used millions of years. Is it true God could have used billions of years to create? Sure, God could have done anything, exactly right. Folks, you know, it's not a matter of what God could have done, isn't it? It's a matter of what he said he did. You see, it's important to, to grasp this idea. You see, how did Satan tempt Eve way back at the beginning? See, he put questions in her mind. Did God really say this? You know, got questions, and then all of a sudden the lie sneaks in. No, you won't really die. See, you'll have knowledge. Everything will be okay and things like that. And has Satan been using that same tactic down through history to get people to first question this book and then not believe it all together? What do you think? Oh, yeah, big time. And why is he so successful? You see, this is our problem. You see, we want to be in charge. We don't want to be told what to do. We want to make up our own truth. You see, so answers in Genesis... We're not all about maybe that side issue, creation, evolution, and I think what we're all about is upholding the authority of the Word of God right from that first page, right? And we're upholding that authority right from the very first chapters of Genesis, right? That literal history, and we're proclaiming the gospel message that rests on the authority of Scripture that's grounded in that literal history that's found in Genesis. See, that's what we're all about, is the authority of Scripture. But you see, Satan has down through history, has, has what we call the Genesis 3 attack. For, for Eve, it was, well, you, you, you don't have to believe what God said about you won't die and things like that. But down through history, it's been, well, can you, can you believe Jesus is the Son of God? And then Satan questions, well, is it really salvation by faith alone? Right? And see, down through history, there have been different attacks. Today, the Genesis 3 attack really is, can you believe the whole Bible? See, he's not just attacking those. He's just attacking the foundational book of the Bible. And if you can't believe this, I guess you can't believe any of it, right? And because they say, well, science says, so you can't believe this first part, part of the Bible. And that's how he's attacking. So what we do is we start out, when we go around speaking, we start out talking about we can believe the real history right from the very beginning, and we like to draw the big picture with the seven C's. Now, I went through it this morning, and let me go through it again, just in case maybe you weren't listening, or maybe you weren't here, but let me just go through it again very quickly. It starts with C for creation, that God made a perfect earth for us to live in. That's what we sang this morning, right? How God, how we were perfect, but what happened? We sinned, didn't we? Yeah, a perfect earth, we could live forever in perfect fellowship with God, but what? We sinned. We call that the cor corruption when Adam sinned and it changed everything. And now we live in a sin-cursed earth where bad things happen. And sin got so bad that God destroyed the world in a global catastrophe, a global flood. And then after the flood, people still didn't obey God. Right. People didn't spread out like they were told to. They stayed in one place. God built a t that, uh, the people built a tower in rebellion against God, and God came down and confused the languages of different family groups, causing the family groups to spread out all over the earth. And eventually, the Creator Himself, Jesus Christ, came down and took on human flesh and uh, suffered and died in our place and rose again. And when He comes back, well... He's going to restore us back to much like it was at the beginning. 
So what was it like at the beginning? Remember, there was no death and there was no suffering. That was perfect fellowship with God, right? You're looking forward to that in the future, correct? Yeah. All right. That gets you going here this morning. All right. You see, this is the real history of the universe all the way back from the beginning. But the world has a totally different history. You say, no, you see, the Bible's wrong. Well, science has proven it. You know, you've got to go along with evolution in millions of years. What is evolution in millions of years? Have you ever heard that before? Well, somebody said, well, I learned it in science class, so it's got to be science. You know what it really is? It's a fallen man's attempt to try to figure out how we got here without having to believe in God, just a pure naturalistic idea of how we got here. Really, what we call it the counterfeit religion of the world. Really. Yeah, the counterfeit belief. It's really the pagan religion of the world. Is it really a religion? Well, you see, people that don't want to believe in God, and they've got to have an idea of how we got here, and they have a story of how we got here. They're sticking to it. They desperately want you and your kids to believe that story too, and they just happen to be convinced of well, all the evidence. It's all on the side of evolution, and only ignorant or evil people would believe that Bible, right? So now... As a result, we are in the middle of a cultural war. Have you noticed the sides being lined up in our country? I think they're lined up more today than they ever have been, maybe since the Civil War. And what is it that really divides our country? I talked to one man, he says, well, I know what divides our country. He says, I watch Fox News. It's all about taxes and health care. Really, those are peripheral issues. You know what really divides our country? Really, is who's in charge. Where are you going to find truth? Are we going to run our, our country and ourselves by what God says? Or are we going to run everything by the way man says things ought to be? You see, if the Bible is directly from our Creator, and we can trust every word, folks, it's the only truth in a world that's just going mad. If that's the case, what would we do? why we would humble ourselves and seek God's word and immerse ourselves in it and find truth in God's word. But, folks, what if you're not convinced when you open it up that you can believe this part or this part? And things, you know, well, you certainly wouldn't seek truth there. You would seek truth in yourself. You see, this is how we are divided. We're going to either find truth in man's ideas or, or what God actually said. Now, we would expect that the atheists would attack God's word. I mean, they don't believe it. That's fine. You cannot believe it. The problem is we've got most of our Bible teachers and our Bible-believing colleges will tell us, well, you can't accept what God really said in Genesis. You've got to go with what the atheists say. You've got to go with the atheist belief of what they think happened. Right? Why? Because that's science. All right? We talked about that in, in Sunday school, right? Well, in either case, you got the atheists and most of our Bible teachers telling the world one single message, you can't believe what God actually said in his word. So what happens to a country when you knock out the authority of this word? All right? So what's happened to a whole generation of kids right in front of our face? How about biblical morality? What about the gospel itself? So we're going to take a look at these. Let's start with What's happening to a whole generation of young people? Do you know that at one time, the Bible was the foundational textbook in our public school system? Yeah, see, kids learned to read with A is for Adam, right? And things like that. But then what happened? Well, then they took religion out of school, right? Did they take religion out of school? Yes. Okay, well, that's a trick question, folks. All right, all right. See, actually, they didn't take religion out of school, all right? What they did is they took out this authority, all right, and what they replace it with. They replaced it with another authority, right? See, we, they replaced it with the pagan religion of the world. You see, there's no God. See, we evolved survival of the fittest, and besides, you can make up your own truth. You become your own authority. See, isn't that the pagan religion of the world? See? Now, is secular humanism that is founded in evolution, is that really a religion? Now, a lot of people like Bill Nye would say, no, it's not a religion. Why? We don't believe in God, right? Well, let's see what this uh, atheist had to say. Uh, 
He said, the battle for humankind's future must be waged in one in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as proselytizers of a new faith, a new religion of humanity, a new faith of humanism. Yeah. Is it a religion? He understands it is. Now, folks, you know, we need to understand that we ought to pray for the teachers that are in the public school system. My son-in-law is a, uh, he's a principal in a public school system in, a, in the middle school. And he tells me he's got the answer books on his, on his desk. Right. Yeah, he need to know that. You see, they're in the thick of it. We need to pray for them. But we have to understand that there's another religion being taught nonetheless. You see, there's a battle going on for the hearts and minds of our children. How are we doing in this war, moms and dads, grandmas and grandmas? What do you think? Pretty good? Oh, not so good. See, this is why we have this particular book. It's called Already Gone. What it does, it does some research to find out what's happening to a whole generation. The last part of the book is the wake-up call for the church that uh, says this is what we need to do to make sure we don't continue the bleeding of all of our young people. And so in, in this book, we did some research and we found out for the research in the book that in our Bible-believing churches, two out of every three, on average, kids that are going to our Bible-believing churches, two out of every three, by the time they go off to college, they're leaving the church and most of them are coming back. See, so what happens? Well, here's, we, we asked our young people, when did you start, start first having doubts? Well, a lot of people think, well, they went off to college and they start having these doubts. Well, really, they say themselves they start having doubts in middle school and high school. So what's happening is they're, see, we teach spiritual things in church, remember, right? Physical things they get in school. So what's, what's the, uh, they're getting the real truth, physical, you know, you can knock on physical material stuff. They get that in school, right? Yeah. And when they come to church, they get some nice spiritual things of how to be good boys and girls and things like that. And then they get all these things of why they can't believe the Bible. So two out of three, for all practical purposes, they're sitting in church. They're already gone. They're just waiting until mom and dad don't bring them to church anymore. And then they're, then they're, out, they're out of here, right? You see, they're thinking, well, look, geology, the rocklers were laid down over millions of years. You can't believe Genesis. Biology. You know, evolution's true. One kind of animal changed into another. You can't believe the Bible again. What about anthropology? Well, ape-like creatures turned into people. Adam was just a myth. And astronomy, Big Bang happened, then the sun, and then we've got the earth and the planet. You see, the Bible got it all wrong. The Bible says the earth came first, right? You see, they're convinced that all this is real science, Big Bang and millions of years of rock layers and so on. But what the Bible says, that's just faith, that's just myth, you can believe it, it's nice, right? It gives us nice moral things to say and so on. You know what we really have, folks? We talked about it in Sunday school, but it's important to grasp this idea. We really have observational science, the sci kind of science that we can observe in the present. It gives us great things like computers and cell phones and, and cures for diseases. I mean, you, you like science, don't you? You're not against science, are you? No, good, all right. Uh, and then we have two beliefs about the past. We have a belief, right? The evolutionists have a belief too. The trouble is they cheat and they call their belief science. And then they point the finger at you Christians, you don't believe in science. Like I said this morning, you're not gonna let them get away with it anymore, right? Exactly right. So we gotta move along. You see, people don't know that real observational science confirms what God's word says goes against man's idea. They don't know it. Why? We're raising a whole generation of kids that have only been allowed to see one way of looking at things. Well, it's obvious. This is science. This is truth. You can believe that mystical stuff if you want to, but it always goes against science. Can you understand why we're losing a whole generation of kids? Well, not just kids. What about biblical morality in our culture? See, while people ought to be ashamed of themselves with some of the things that are being done today in our country, you know, the world out there, they're celebrating freedom from God. Right? Newsweek article here says, the decline and fall of Christian America. Yay, they're excited about this idea. Well, at one time, we, in America, we just understood what marriage was all about, right? 
part of our culture. Okay, kids were raised up. Everybody knew what marriage was. But have you ever gotten a discussion today about marriage? How does it usually end up? Well, one person says, well, this is what I think. And somebody says, no, this is what I think. And the other person says, well, how can you be so arrogant and unloving to think that? And he goes back. Yeah, you've heard that, right? Yeah, we get that all the time. Well, you know what? Jesus was asked a question about marriage when he was on earth. What did he say? Did he say, well, this is what I think? Did he say that? Why not? If anybody could say it, it would be God. Right? But he didn't. What did he actually say? Well, let's take a look and see what he says. He, he's actually saying, don't ask my opinion. God's already spoken on the matter, and he's sort of flabbergasted, if you think about it. He's, saying he's talking to people that are, ought to know the Bible, and he says, have you not read? I don't think you quite catch it with the old English. You know what he's actually saying? He's saying to these people, haven't you read your Bible? That's what he's saying. You know, in other words, you know, this is how we know what, what real marriage is. You've got to go back to the first part of the Bible. God's already spoken on the matter, so don't ask my opinion. Let's go to Genesis, and he quotes. He says, For this cause shall a man and, uh, leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. He says, This is real history. This is the absolute authority. Genesis is real. They accepted that. See, that's how you answer the question. That's how he did it. Right? So in our culture today, people are either going to accept what God says or man's ideas. They're going to say, either you believe this history or you're going to believe man's counterfeit history. Right? And unless you believe in the literal history, a literal man and a literal woman in a literal garden, and unless you believe that, guess what? Marriage can be anything that you want it to be, right? It's not going to stop where it is, folks, let me tell you, right? You see? And so what happens to churches that have started out, well, you don't have to believe the first part. We, we believe in Jesus. You, don't, you see, well, they're saying, well, I guess if there's no Adam and Eve, and then there's, we, can, we can accept anything, right? <clears throat> well, and what happens if we don't go along with their agenda? Do we get put in the same category as haters? Oh, yeah, exactly right. What do we do about it? Well, who did Jesus Christ get upset with when he was on earth? Did he get upset with people that are caught in some of the worst sins of his culture? Or maybe was it the uh, religious hypocrites of the day? Oh, yes. How about people that were caught up into sin? What did he say? He said, I'd like to spend some time with you. I want to go to your house. How about that? You see, what we need to understand is there are a lot of people that are caught in what we would call some of the worst. And I think Jesus thought maybe the hypocrites were the worst ones, but not, let's not go there. But, you know, the, the world has a certain way of looking at things. We, we, have, uh, we have a certain way of looking at things, and maybe it's not the way God looks at it. But there are people that are caught in what we would call very terrible sins. And, and they're not coming in here. Right? Maybe we need to get out of our comfort zone, do what Jesus did, spend some time with people, let them know that God loves them, we love them. Until we do that type of thing, we're still going to get called haters, right? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Okay, you're, you're awake out there. You can say amen. I know, I know you can. All right. Well, how about the sanctity of life as opposed to abortion? You know, it all goes back to whether Genesis is true or not. Is this just an evolving animal? Is that our real history? Or is this really created in the image of God? Is that our real history? And besides, who owns your body anyways? Does God own your body? Were you created or were you evolved and you own your body? How about the rule of law as opposed to, well, rule by tyrants? Where did the rule of law come from? little civics lesson for, uh, uh, for all of us. You know, the rule of law, see, at one time in our country, people just thought it was obvious. It was just what? Self-evident that we were created, correct? And if we were created, then who's the highest authority? God is. It's just obvious, correct? And if, we're the, if God's the highest authority, then what? See, this is where we get the idea of individual freedom. 
and where even the government has to obey laws because God's the highest authority. But what's, the, what's obvious today according to the government? Well, it's obvious that we evolved, right? And if we evolved, then who are we? Well, we're just evolving animals. And we need to be taken care of like a farmer takes care of animals. So how do farmers take care of animals? Well, they make sure they're fed, right? They give them proper health care. They give them proper clothing, right? They, and they call out of the, uh, the, the, the herd those that don't fit in with the herd. That's how farmers take care of animals, correct? Let me tell you a secret, most best kept secret of evolution. See, <clears throat> those countries that have stressed and taught evolution have produced some of the worst mass murderers in all of world history killing millions of people to bring in what they thought was a perfect world, right? Yes. Here's another lesson that we can learn from history. You see, back in Martin Luther's time, there's 500 years ago, there was, a, uh, <clears throat> there was a revolution, a revolution of thought, where he brought much of the church out of the idea where man decides truth, where the word of God gives us truth, the authority of God's word. And then... The, these ideas, Reformation ideas, to run your, our lives according to God's word, it trickled all through Europe. And this happened to be the same time that people were migrating to different parts of the earth, right? And to this day, these nations that re are represented in red, for the most part, they represent the nations that are 500 years later, but these are the ones that have been most profoundly influenced by the Protestant Reformation. And they just happen to have, well, the, they just happen to be the most prosperous nations. Go figure, why is that, right? And they happen to have the most respect for liberty, the most respect for rule of law. They happen to have the most respect for women. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You see, the world will tell you, well, it's Christianity that holds humankind back. No, biblical principles elevates a people. Why? See, because it's the way we were designed to function. Okay? See? This is the authority of God's word. You see, at one time, we were one nation under God, indivisible, while we had unifying values and moral beliefs. See, the majority of people held to the Judeo-Christian worldview. But today, when you knock out the authority of God's word, now we are one nation under many gods, many beliefs, and we are tearing ourselves apart. Right? So you know what? When the atheists and the Bible teachers join forces telling us that, oh, this is real history, right? This over here is myth. You know what happens when you knock out the authority of God's word without the restraining force of this word in our culture? It looks to me that we might be headed for some trouble. Right? What do we do about it? Well, we've got to turn as a nation away from this. We've got to turn back to the authority of God's word. We've got to turn back to that literal history. See, are you getting the idea that Genesis is important? I sure hope so. I'm just getting started. Right? Yeah, hi. That's just the introduction. I'm just kidding. All right. Well, let's take a look at the last moral issue I want to talk about. Uh, how about euthanasia, right? Do you believe in that as opposed to God created, the meaning of life? You see, the, the state of, Calif uh, of Colorado just voted to allow doctor-assisted suicides. And how about uh, the Med Journal of Medical Ethics? What do you do when it starts talking about this? I'll read it for you. It says, after birth abortion, why should the baby live? Newborn babies are not actual persons and do not have the moral right of, to life, and parents should have up to 28 days to decide if they want to keep them or not. Are they really talking about stuff like that? Yes, and even worse. So what do we do? How do we defend biblical morality in the face of this? We say, well, this is my opinion. No, maybe we need to do what Jesus did. What did he say? Don't ask my opinion. God already spoke on the matter. Let's go to our literal history. Let's go to the book of Genesis. What would happen if we did that? And what would happen? Well, you know what? What, what happens is that the world will attack us. and say, well, you can't believe that book. Why would you believe a book written by goat herders 4,000 years ago? I mean, grow up. This is an age of science. Don't Really? So know what we say? Well, we don't talk about Genesis. We talk about you know, traditional values, family values, things like that, right? Isn't that what we do? 
Yeah. Why not biblical values? Yeah, we're too chicken. You see, we don't know how to defend that first book of the Bible, so we just talk about spiritual things, right? Maybe we need to know these are the reasons why I know the Word of God is true and why you should believe it too. And besides, science hasn't proven the Bible's a myth. Really, real observational science confirms what God's Word is. Maybe we need to have that kind of confidence, don't you think? Just a couple things that we have. We've got uh, the, the, this book here. We've got this video just to help us understand how to share this. Let me tell you a little bit about truth and how the world perceives it. You see, the world doesn't look at right and wrong anymore and measure it with universal truths, and it's just based upon opinion. It's like taste in ice cream. So, Pastor, what kind of, what kind of ice cream do you like? He likes chocolate ice cream. You know, I like vanilla. So therefore, I think you should like vanilla too. Now, is that a stupid statement or what? I mean, it's my opinion I like vanilla. It's his opinion he likes chocolate. How could I be so intolerant and un unloving as to say you need to... Have you heard that kind of stuff before? You Christians, how can you be so intolerant and go by... How we have to go by your opinion, and what do we do? Well, I guess you're right. We won't. Yeah. Really... You know what, in a, in a God-created world, there is such thing as, as uh, opinions, right? There's also such thing as truth and error. And for Christians, we need to know the difference, right? Okay. But in a God-created world, truth is like putting gas in your car instead of sand. So what if I saw you out in the parking lot here, you're scraping up sand and gravel, sticking it down your gas tank, and I go up, don't put sand in your gas tank. Is that a stupid statement? Why not? It's his opinion that sand is cheaper. <laughs> How could I be so intolerant and unloving as for him to go with my opinion about sand and not his? Or folks, maybe it's the most loving thing that I could do for him, right? Because if he puts that sand in there, it's going to mess up his car, right? You see, it, what I said, it reflects truth. See, the designer of the car designed it to run on gas, not on sand. And he even gave an instruction manual to tell us how to, what to do, right? And folks, we didn't evolve either, right? Yes, we were designed and God gave us an instruction manual. And maybe we need to have the confidence to say in a loving way, it says, you need to function the way God designed us. Let's look at, at God's word. Amen? Yeah. Amen? All right. Uh, you, <laughs> so what happens, though, to... Uh, Biblical morality, when you knock out the authority of God's word, is this what's happening in our country? Are we seeing it crumble right in front of our face? Yes, yes exactly right. So we're not only losing a whole generation of kids, not only losing biblical morality, but what about the gospel itself? You know, the world is even asking questions and writing books about why did Jesus come. But in order to understand why Jesus came, what book of the Bible do you think we ought to go to? Now, remember, we're called Answers in? Yes. Okay, so we're going to go to Genesis. You, you're good. You're good, right? All right. God said when he created, everything was very good, right? So let's think about this. Adam and Eve would live in a very good earth, no death, no suffering. They could live forever, right? Do you think that there was death and suffering and, and animals eating each other and and um, babies being born with mutations and all kinds of problems. Is that what God would call very good? No. no, see, God made a very good earth, a reflection of his character. It was a world where the wolf and the lamb could lay down together. The, the lion would eat grass just like an ox. Well, how do I know it was like that back then? Because who talks about specifically the wolf and the lamb? Anybody know? In Scripture. It's the book of Isaiah. He's saying, yes... And the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the, the lion shall eat grass like an ox, right? Okay. So who, what's he talking about? What it was like in the past or what's like in the future? In the future, exactly right. So how do I know it was like that in the, in the past? Well, Scripture tells us we have an eyewitness. He said every beast, every fowl, everything that creeps on the ground, right, they, on the earth, they, they all ate what? They all ate green herbs. This is our eyewitness account of what it was like. You see, we can't even imagine a world that was perfect where the animals didn't eat each other. Because we live in a sin-cursed earth, don't we? 
where God cursed the earth. And the book of Acts tells us when Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to be a restitution. He's going to restore us back to much like it was at the beginning. What it was like in the beginning? Yeah, perfect earth. The wolf and the lamb would feed together. What are we looking forward in the future? The same thing. So here's the seven seas as we talked about it. Why do we believe this is true? Is it, okay, really, it's not just a spiritual idea. See, it's related back to literal, physical events. There was a literal time in history when there was a real perfect earth, and that gives us something to be restored back to, correct? All right. Is Genesis is important? Okay, <laughs> let's move along. See, it was Adam's sin that brought about death and suffering. And now we live in a world where there's, what, Adam and Eve were kicked out into a, a sin-cursed earth of uh, survival, the fittest, and worst of all, you know, we're, we are separated from our creator. And this is why God killed the first animal. See, it was a picture of the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. There needed to be a blood sacrifice to take care of the sins of the world, correct? And God used that same object lesson, the Passover lamb, the Jewish sacrifice, but can animal sacrifice take away sin? You seem pretty confident of that, <clears throat> all right? I mean, it certainly would have been a lot easier for Jesus Christ if animal sacrifice could have done it. You think about that, right? Well, why couldn't it happen, all right? <clears throat> well, first of all, we didn't evolve, did we? We're not related to the animal kingdom, right? We're what? Created specifically in God's image. So for someone to be our, our sacrifice, our, rep our replacement, you might say, there had to be one of our relatives. Right? Yes. So who was it? Well, had to be somebody born with a physical body, right? related all the way back to Adam. Do you begin to understand why God himself had to take on human flesh to come and sacrifice, and he's the only one that could be the sacrifice for, for mankind. You think, well, so who is this creator? Well, Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe, and not only that, what is he? He's the promised seed that would stomp on the head of Satan, destroy his power, right? He's also the seed of Abraham. Is that important? Yes, right? God promised somebody from, this, from the lineage of Abraham would bless the entire world. And he's also got more specific here. He's not only from Abraham, but a particular family from Abraham's lineage, the lineage of David. He said somebody from David's lineage is going to rule and reign forever. How could that be? Everybody that's born to David has to die because we all die, right? Unless God himself took on human flesh, related all the way back to King David, right, all the way back to Abraham. How many people have read the genealogies? So-and-so begat so-and-so. Oh, a few of you. They're in the Christmas account, Matthew and Luke. Do we read them at Christmas time? Nah. We go to the fun stuff like the shepherds. And but God thought they were important. Why? See, he wanted people to know, who is that baby in the manger? Why, who is he? Why, his physical lineage goes all the way back to King David, all the way back to Abraham, right? All the way back to Noah, all the way back to, in an unbroken line, back to that first man, Adam himself. See, without that literal history, folks, we really don't have any gospel to tell, do we? We just have a, a, some spiritual ideas like anybody else's spiritual ideas, right? See, literal physical history is the foundation of all our spiritual doctrines. But you know what? There's a lot of people who don't think that literal history is important, right? Now, when I've talked about some of these Bible teachers that would say that that's not important, that doesn't mean they don't love the Lord, okay? Don't get me wrong, okay? Some of these people love Jesus Christ, and we're going to spend eternity with them for, forever, right? But yet, see, they're, they're misunderstanding something about Genesis because, see, they're convinced, well, look at all the rock layers, right? And it's obvious, millions of years. So i, I got to talk about rock layers just for a minute here. This is important. See, if you look at the rock layers through the glasses of millions of years and you see dead things in it, fossils, so therefore it's obvious that the rock layers show a history of millions of years of death, right? Okay. So, yeah, millions of years of death, but what God's word says, death didn't come into the world until Adam sinned. 
We also see fossilized thorns, but God's word said thorns didn't come until after Adam sinned. We see brain cancer and dinosaur bones. So if that's true, right, then I guess dinosaurs have been around for millions of years. Then finally God got around to making Adam and Eve, and he said everything was very good. He just said brain cancer is very good. Okay? I don't think so. You see, let's look at rock layers, how they're laid down. They're laid down in nice flat layers. Then you'd get some erosion, right? Obviously, then you get some more rock layers. Now, if you got lots and lots and lots and lots of time, you'd expect to see rock layers erosion, more rock layers, more. Isn't that what you'd expect to see? But you know what we actually see in the rock layers? Nice flat layers. So here's a cross section of the Grand Canyon. Across the top, we can see massive erosional features, can't we? Right? But we're told to believe, now young people, this is real science. See, these rock layers here, they were laid down over 300 million years with virtually no evidence of any erosional features between, in other words, those layers laid down flat with no rain, no, no ripples, no floods. <laughs> hmm. How about that? Now, actually, what that shows better is that, yes, there was a global flood that laid the layers down very quickly, and then as the waters rushed off, you get all the erosion across the top. Doesn't real observational science really confirm what God's word says and goes against man's ideas? People don't know that. Like this one, here, a geology professor says, look, students, each one of these layers represents millions of years of evolution. And one bright student says, look over here. Here's a tree that stood there for millions of years while the rock layers gradually laid up around it. Uh, how could that? Maybe that's exactly what we'd expect in a global flood. The rock layers would quickly right around these trees, exactly right. You see, but millions of years is crucial to the evolutionary perspective. And today, Charles Darwin is buried in Westminster Abbey, right in the, you know, right in the foundation of the, of the church. And so today, we got much of the church bows the knee to the pagan religion of the world. And we've got young people that grow up in this system that they're only allowed to see one perspective and they become Bible teachers like this man that loves the Lord. But what's he say about Genesis? How old is the world? The best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. Now this is good, you see. I, I, this is a position I can embrace because there are people who, who will sit here and say, no, it's six and a half thousand years old. Um, that, that is not a tenable position? I don't think it's plausible. Uh, the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science okay. in presenting these arguments. Rather, I'm going with the flow of what contemporary cosmology and astrophysics uh, supports. Okay, when he says mainstream science, is he talking about what we can actually observe in the present or man's belief of what they think happened in the past? Which one? Man's belief, right. But, he's just, but he thinks that's science. So you can't believe what God's word says. So if this is true, death and suffering has been around for millions of years. This isn't true then, right? So if that's the case, then death isn't our fault. It's been around for millions of years. If that's the case, then why did Jesus Christ then have to take on human flesh and come and suffer and die to take our punishment if it wasn't our fault to begin with? Right, right. You see... God poured out his wrath upon his son. He suffered and he died to take our punishment so we wouldn't have to, right? But uh, you, know, you know who understands this idea? It's the atheists. Let's listen to what this atheist had to say. No Adam and Eve means no need for a savior. It also means that the Bible cannot be trusted as a source of unambiguous literal truth. It is completely unreliable because it all begins with a myth and builds on that as a basis. No fall of man means no need of atonement and no need for a redeemer. If evolution is true, is he correct? He's got a good point, right? If evolution is true, uh, there's, we don't even need a savior. Let's take a look and see what this Bible teacher says. Um, he's from a Northwestern Nazarene University. He says, Some substitutionary atonement seems, uh, sees original sin as a major reason for, Jesus, for Christ's death. 
But macroevolution calls the fall and the doctrine of original sin into question. Thus, evolution poses a significant challenge to substitutionary atonement. Does it? If evolution is true, does it cause a significant challenge? It certainly does. You know what the problem is? He believes in macroevolution. And he says, uh, the incarnation is not primarily about the cross. God does not need, that, that God does not send Jesus to die. God does not require Jesus' death in order to forgive humanity's sin. In other words, there's got to be lots of ways to get to heaven, correct? You see? You see how that undermines the entire gospel and it's being preached out there in our Bible-believing colleges? Okay? So let's take a look. Why do we believe in a perfect earth? Because there was a perfect earth at the beginning. Why do we believe Jesus had to come? Because there was a real man named Adam who sinned, we needed to have somebody that's related all the way back to him in order to suffer and die for the entire human race. Now, do I believe you have to believe in a young earth in order to be saved? No, we don't believe that at all, right? But see, I worked with uh, somebody when I was in Africa teaching that loved the Lord, but he would say, you know, you got to go along with science with that first part. So I, I would ask him this. Uh, you believe in the virgin birth? That's not scientific. What do you think he'd say? Well, the Bible says that I believe it. How about the resurrection? That's not scientific. What would he say? Well, the Bible says that I believe it. How, how about the new heavens and the new earth? Do you believe in that? I mean, is we going to have to wait around billions of years for God to make that? He said, no. You see, God can do anything. He can make it just like that. Well, what about that God created in six normal days? No, you see, we don't believe that part. Anybody got a problem with that? You see? In other words, he's willing to believe the spiritual ideas, but that literal history that's the foundation for all of our spiritual doctrines, or well, you've got to go with what the atheists say. And they become like Andy Stanley that says this. Here's the deal. Your Sunday school God probably could not be reconciled with science. I understand that. Your Sunday school God, the God that your church left you with as a child or even a middle school or a high school, and it never went beyond that, that God probably cannot be reconciled with science. I mean, God can't be reconciled with modern science. Is he talking about observational science or God can't be reconciled with man's atheist belief? You follow what, I'm, what he's saying? Yeah, but he, he calls that science, all right? And then he goes on to say, And when religion and science conflict, at the end of the day, if you are an honest person, science must win. No, like we said, he thinks science is real, this, you know, Big Bang and all these things. And what God says, that's just mythical. He doesn't know this. He doesn't know observational science, things that we can see, and then we have two beliefs, right? And he's equating science with evolutionist belief, atheist belief, naturalistic belief of how we got here without God, right? And yet they call that science. So let me wrap things up here. I know I'm going a little late. Are you with me here? Is it okay to go five minutes more? Okay, all right. Here's what's happened. Down through history, right, the church has been saying, come to Jesus, come to the cross and be saved. And that's, that's the gospel, right? Martin Luther's time. Martin Luther believed in six normal days about 6,000 years ago and says, come to Jesus, right? Uh, 1600s, Isaac Newton believed the same thing, six normal days. He wrote more on six days than he did about gravity. People don't know that, right? Six days, 6,000 years, right? And he said, believed didn't come to Jesus. But what happened 1700s, along comes the Enlightenment, the age of reason. We've got to have reasonable ways that we got here. Natural processes. So what were they doing? They're getting rid of anything supernatural out of the Bible, like miracles and things like that. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. And then they're looking at the rock layers and they say, well, you know what? They couldn't have been laid down in a global flood because God doesn't do things like that, right? So there must have been laid down over long periods of time. So there was an attack back at that time in the form of millions of years, and it hit. And what did the church say? Ah, it didn't hit the cross. It's not a problem, right? But really, it was an attack upon the first book of the Bible, wasn't it? Okay. Now, if Satan were attacking the cross, we'd get upset, right? You know, have you noticed Satan's sly? Yeah, he attacked in an area the church didn't grasp, right? Attacked the foundation of the cross. Then along came Charles Darwin. 
Now we don't even need God anymore. And now he kept on attacking with millions of years, evolution and things like that, and what happened? Well, <clears throat> then the world realizes it was a direct hit, right? But the church says, ha, it didn't hit the cross, right? Now the whole world is permeated in unbelief, right? So what do we need to do? Yeah. Well, you know what? The church has been out there saying, don't worry about all that evidence that shows you can't believe the Bible. I mean, that's okay, right? Just trust in Jesus. Is that working for us today? We're losing a whole generation basically because of that. All right? Just take a blind leap of faith against all the evidence that just doesn't work. Right? So this is why we have answers in Genesis. Creation ministries. See, we want to come in. We need to rebuild that first history. The book of Genesis that the cross rests on. And then when those missiles come, we can give people the ammunition to blow them right out of the sky. Actually, we want to be in the background. We want every mom and dad, every grandma and grandpa to, to know how to defend their faith and know how to teach it to the next generation. Amen? This is why we have the books that we brought in. They, we've got a special there. You need to have these books in your library at least or in your personal library. And we've got answer books for teens that deals with specific social issues, problems that teens deal with, answer books for little kids, right? The, the, creation, the, the magazine that comes to your home, great apologetics tool. Here is a, uh, this is answers for kids. It's like a whole year, almost a whole year's program that'll take little kids and deal with where do we get the Bible? What about radiometric dating? Do we got to talk about stuff like that to elementary kids? We better start. Yeah, we better start. And, we got, and how about the, the big book of history? We mentioned that, right? It gives the real history from Adam to Barack Obama and how all of our biblical history is real in real historical events that happen. It's not just stories, okay? Lots of different types of things like, like dinosaurs and dragons and, and things like that. Well, what happens when the atheists and many of the Bible teachers join forces telling us you can't believe that what the Bible says, what God actually says? Do you begin to understand why we're losing everything? Yeah. See, Genesis is important. So one more time. Why do we believe in a perfect earth? Because it was a perfect earth at the beginning, something to be restored back to. Why do we believe Jesus came? Is it just a spiritual idea? Or is it rooted in literal history? There was a literal man named Adam, right, that sinned. And because of his sin, we needed one of the, his physical relatives, right? That's why we have the genealogies, somebody to come and suffer and die for us. But it had to be God himself, right? And folks, there was a real catastrophe in the past. God judged the world in the past, didn't he? All right, he judged, there was only one way to be saved. God provided a way of salvation. And you folks, is there another judgment coming? Yes. You better believe it. There is. And there's only one way to be saved from this judgment that's coming, is to enter the door through Jesus Christ. I trust every single one of you know for sure that if you were to die that you have entered the door through Jesus Christ. You know you're born again. You are, know you're in the family uh, of God. I, tr I trust that's, uh, that, that's the whole goal of Answers in Genesis. Right? And because, you see, it's not just a spiritual idea like anybody else's spiritual idea. It's based in literal historical events. You can trust the Bible. All of it. Amen? Thank you, Bob, for sharing with us. We're thankful for you, for your ministry. Thank you for spending the morning with us. Uh, we want to be able to uh, help support the Answers in Genesis, minist Answers in Genesis ministry through uh, Bob and Lois. We're going to be taking another offering if the ushers could get ready. Um, and as we're doing that, uh, Velma will lead us in a closing song. And you guys will be available after the service to answer any questions and be about great.